Hello and welcome to the 50 Women Over 50 podcast. I'm your host, Sherry Lynn Starkey. On the show, I highlight women who have broken down barriers, they've changed the status quo, or they've simply lived remarkable lives over the age of 50. So far, my guests have included pioneering entrepreneurs, passionate activists, artists, educators, and more. Get ready to be inspired, informed, and empowered as together we extol the lives of 50 exceptional women over 50. Today, I'm welcoming to the show Tina Davidson, a highly regarded American composer whose music stands out for its emotional depth and lyrical dignity. Her recently published memoir, Let Your Heart Be Broken, looks at how her childhood full of secrets continues to inform her creative process today. In this interview, she talks about how secrets from long ago can have a real power over you your whole lifetime. It's a fascinating story of discovery. So let's start at the very beginning. Tell me about your 50th birthday. Oh my goodness. My 50th birthday, I don't think much happened. I was in the middle of a marriage and he had three small children. I was taking care of them. I had moved out of Philadelphia. I had my only child was about 15 at that point. So we had moved out to Lancaster. And it's really interesting because I've had this right now 45-year career. So it was like 30-year career at that point or, or less. And I had been very successful. I'd written a lot of music. And I needed a change. I needed something to change. And I thought, oh, you can write music from anywhere. And these little children were wonderful. And we had them every other week, full time. And I just really stepped into that life. But interestingly enough, I did start to lose myself. Right. And and that, it's interesting. I don't remember my 50th birthday, but I remember giving my husband his 50th birthday. He was three years younger than I am. And I actually wrote him a piece for chorus, hired a chorus to come to the party, and they actually sang this piece that I had written for him. But I don't remember my birthday. Interesting. Yes. I guess if you're running around after three kids, you're pretty busy. I was busy and I loved them. And I, I embraced that life. As I was going towards 60 and the children were growing up, I really had to then take a much bigger stock in my life and what I was doing with it. Mm-hmm. And what, did, what happened then? I, I, I left the marriage. Right. I was 59. I was, the kids had grown up. They were, the youngest was in, I think he was 17. He was a junior in high school. He was doing really well. He had had a lot of struggles. The girls were in college. And uh, when I was 59, I started writing this memoir. Okay. And, And I think that was very important. I think I was sort of taking stock of things of where I, where were my origins? I had a, a very difficult past. What was the relationship between my growing up and my life so far and how I had channeled it into the music? So that 59th year, I was actually at the Cabrillo Festival in California. And I just remember going to rehearsals. I had an orchestra piece that was being performed, just writing and writing and writing, and then going to perform rehearsals and performances and then writing and writing. So that 59th year was really consumed by writing the first draft of my memoir. And I don't think it was a mistake that I happened to be writing it at that juncture of my life and realizing that my marriage was not working for me and that I needed to leave. And so when I was 60 and a month old, I I left with my little dog. I mean, that's a bold and brave step to step out like that of your life at a time when many people are telling us 
oh, it's time to retire. It's time to plan for your old age. It's, I, I'm trying to imagine, it must have felt like you were taking a leap off a cliff or something. It, it, I think that's a, a very good description of it. I, I was renting a friend's house for three months and I knew that I wasn't going back. I, I knew that. I don't know if I communicated it that well at that point, but I, in my heart of hearts, I knew that I wasn't in a nourished place and I needed to recoup and take stock of myself. And it was a very hard transition. I was kind of homeless for four years. I rented apartments, I rented houses. I was sort of constantly moving in those four years. I was teaching piano and composition and really struggling to pull my career back together. Yeah. I had had a very successful commission by a wonderful virtuosic violinist, Grammy winner, Hilary Hahn, and she had recorded it and it was doing very well, but I was completely out of touch with my music world. You can write anywhere. But in a field of music where you need to be in touch with ensembles and performers and presenters, you kind of have to be there present. You have to be there physically. So one of the things that I started to do was my, I had a sister who lived in New York City. So I w decided I was going to go up at least for four days every two weeks and go to concerts. And I just like, jumped in and just went to all these concerts and all these plays and all these museums. And I realized that I was nourishing myself because I had, I had given so much out to these wonderful, wonderful little children who were growing up and I hadn't stopped to replenish myself. So I just spent so much time up in New York and in Philadelphia. And I was also trying to figure out where I was going to live. And I had lived 25 years in Philadelphia. It was a city that was very good to me professionally. But man, going back there in your 60s with all the noise and the dirt and the commotion and the traffic. And then I thought, oh, well, I'll go to New York. But <laughs> ditto, same yeah. problem. So I just found that living in, in Lancaster and not having children at home, I could jump on a train and be in New York or Philadelphia very easily. And it seemed like a really good place to then settle in the city of Lancaster. So the kind of nomad thing you were doing for four years, was that also like a product of, of impoverishment from the separation in your marriage? No, it was really much more of just planning, not wanting to make decisions too quickly. Okay. I, I couldn't decide where I was going to live. I decided when I left my marriage, I had sort of given myself a five-year plan. And it was really in the fourth year that I would decide if I was going to live in Lancaster or in, in a bigger city. And so I think sometimes when you have a plan in your head, even though it's not a very specific or concrete plan, it can start to act on you. So it slowed me down. It allowed me, oh, phew, I didn't have to think about housing in the first four years. I would just go from place to place. That was fine. You know, I had all my furniture in, in a storage place. And then when it was right, I just actually found the perfect house. I kind of stumbled on it. I wasn't really looking. And it has a great big living room that you step down in. And I realized I could have my grand piano in there. Yeah. and also a, a place to teach and a place to write music. And it was kind of a wreck. <laughs> it hadn't been renovated for 65 years, but then that was an opportunity to really create a place for myself. Right. So I think the first five years, five, six years were really about rounding myself, finding my place and finding my connections. Why did you decide to write a memoir? I think, again, I was trying to not only understand my past in not through music this time, but through language, through words. And I think I did it because I really wanted to bring 
attention to my music from another angle. Mm -hmm. So the memoir is not only stories of my childhood, but every other chapter are journals that are really about my, my looking as an adult at my childhood, processing it, and also writing music about it. So I have a piece, for instance, called Dark Child Sings, which is for cello quartet. And it's really about that sad little dark child in me who needed a voice and needed to be able to express, I do think of it as a he himself, and and sing out also getting past the sadness into more of the joy. So I was composing a lot of music sort of autobiographically in a funny way. And I wanted to understand that better as I moved through my 60s. And I also wanted to give that music another opportunity, which I thought I could do through the publishing world. So who are your readers? Oh, my goodness. So it came out in March. It came out. I'm now 70. It's having a lot of success. It's called Let Your Heart Be Broken. And you can buy it on Amazon. It's getting a lot of reviews. It's getting a lot of podcasts and interests. And my readers are all over the map. Because it talks a lot about the trauma that I had as a child, some some people are really interested in that. Other people are really fascinated by the artistic journey and how I think about music, how I relate it to myself and how I express it. So you can actually go on Spotify and listen to a lot of the music that I'm writing about. Oh. So there are all these, I th- I know that some people say, oh, I, I don't know anything about music and now I'm really interested. Or people have, composers have written me and said, you're speaking about, it's interesting, the women composers have written to me and said, you're speaking about the way I write music. And right. I really appreciate that you found the words for that. Can you tell me a little bit about the experiences that you were drawing on in your memoir? So the big thing that happened to me, I was born in Sweden. And when I was six months old, I was placed into a foster home. And my foster mother was Solveig. And I was the youngest of four. So I had three brothers. The youngest of those three brothers was almost my same age. And we were kind of brought up as twins. So I lived with that family for three years. And then one day, American woman came, she was a professor, and she adopted me. And this was in the 50s. And there wasn't as much language at that point, or they, they didn't think to talk to children. So suddenly I left and I came to America. And I my mother married. I was the oldest of five children, and when I was 21, I'd always known that I was adopted. I went back to Sweden. I was actually sort of babysitting a family friend, a friend of the family's, her, their daughter in Sweden, and I decided maybe I'll go to the adoption agency and find out about my parents, and I called them up, and they said, oh, come down. And she was sitting there reading my file and she said, let me read you this letter. This is from your biological mother. And it turned out that my adopted mother is actually my biological mother. And I had been brought up as an adopted child, but to, I think the first instinct of hers was to protect me and protect her and bring me back as an adopted child. But then she just couldn't quite figure out or didn't want to tell anybody. So she never actually told anybody that I was her biological child. Her family didn't know. My stepfather didn't know. I didn't know. It's incredible the pressure that they used to put women under. eh? It's incredible. Yes. Imagine how heartbroken she must have been. Well, I mean, you don't have to imagine you were there, but. Well, I, I think so. And I think also. I think the saddest part is sometimes when you have such a secret and you're worried, you're it's you're being realistic about life. It's not even being paranoid. Mm, yes. That can kind of solidify. And after 10 or 20 years, she was not able to feel any differently. She really didn't want anybody to know after a while. Mm. And that kind of secret had and that 
had become paranoia in a funny way. Yes. She yeah. she was a, a full professor. She was a, a an amazing teacher, really an amazing person. But man, secrets, secrets ha- can have a real power over you and can really warp your you, you start to protect yourself and everything around this secret. Mm. And so there was a lot of trauma. I not thought. only from not only from myself, but my siblings as well. So did you tell them when you discovered the sequel? She didn't want me to tell them. She didn't want them to know they were they were I was 21, so they were at least seven years younger than I was, seven oh, to fourteen. Yes. I did insist that she tell my stepfather. So it also caused a lot of tension over the years between us. Oh, because yeah. And did, have you ever told your siblings? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yes. I said, okay, I'll wait until they get older. And when I thought they were old enough and in high school, I told them my stepfather knew. And then I connected with my biological family as well. And this is the other odd little twist is that when I was in high school, my mother said, oh, I'd like you to go away to school. And there's, so I'd like you to go to this private school outside of Philadelphia. And I thought, oh, I really want to study music, but okay. So I went and then my senior year, she said, well, actually there's this family friend and he would like you to live with his, he and his family, he has four little children and it would save a lot of money. So I said, okay. So I lived in my biological father's house for a year, yeah. last year of high school without knowing he was my father. Didn't look like him? Oh, yeah. I looked like him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there was a lot of tension in the household that I so didn't understand. And my mother yeah. had a real way of disconnecting from sort of what was going on. And I said, Mom, they, they seem to be fighting a lot. And she said, oh. Husbands and wives always fight. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Just just make sure you help. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, no wonder your book is Cellar Light Hotcakes. What a fascinating <laughs> story. And I, I so appreciate your sympathy about women in those situations. I think it was very hard, and there were choices. And I that generation really didn't speak about their issues. They didn't. And and I think to some extent, therapy was starting in the 70s and 80s and 90s. But my mother, she was born in the 20s. She thought it was being disloyal. So there was this also this issue of being loyal to the family. And if you discussed yes. your problems, then you were being disloyal. Mm-hmm. And so she, she didn't... She, didn't like it at all that I was doing therapy or really trying to heal myself Mm -hmm. because she thought I would be talking about her. Well, of course I was, but, but we have a different sort of relationship now with, with speaking about her past and trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. And certainly my mother's generation felt that was the last thing you should do. Mm, yes. The silent generation, they called it, right? There's a reason mm-hmm. for that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Listen, tell me if you had to do it over again, what advice would you give your 30 year old self? Oh, boy. When I was 30, I, I had an, a newborn. I was making some really good choices at, when I was 30. I, I was looking at my daughter as holding her, as nursing her. And I thought, boy, life couldn't be better than this. I was writing music that I loved. I had this wonderful daughter. I was very much in love with her father. And yet my life was also kind of falling apart. And I didn't understand that. And I realized at that moment that I needed to do some work on myself. I needed to sort of appease the ghosts in my family. Because if I didn't, I was going to hand this trauma over to this little baby. Mm -hmm. Kind of the way my mother handed her trauma to me. Yes. And so it was a a big decision. And I decided to really seriously bite the bullet and do a lot of work on my life. So I don't know what I would tell myself. I was pretty intense. But I don't 
think I could have been any other way. I think I kind of had to lurch through those years and do what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I certainly wasn't going to listen to anybody. (laughs) It wasn't like I I would have listened to myself even, even. I was very driven by the past and really spent the whole decade of the 40s really assimilating myself. Mm. Sounds like you did a lot of hard work. For sure. I think so, yeah. What are you most hopeful about for the future? Oh, boy, in our present political climate, I think the power of connection. I, When I talk to young composing students, I always tell them to be in connection with the people around you, not to be worried so much about the big opportunity or the or the the big interview, the big job, but look around you, see what's in your community, use what's around you. And I think using the companionship of others, the support of others, I'm I love composing. So I want everybody to be a composer. I think it would change politics almost if if everybody had that opportunity to really center themselves in their creativity and trust their creativity. So I and I also am in this wonderful teaching position as a private teacher and to be able to say yes all the time to my students. Mm-hmm. You want to play that kind of music? Great. Yeah, sure. Yes. You want to write a piece? Absolutely. Oh, you don't know how to write you don't know music notation? No problem. We'll figure it out through graphic notation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I feel that this creativity is a really positive place for me. Good. What are you doing to keep yourself happy these days? What are you doing for fun? Oh, boy. Well, of course, my work is, I love it. I think as an artist, anything you do is feeding your work. So I have a great group of friends. One of the groups of friends, we meet every every week and a half, about every 10 days, we meet and we draw together. I don't know, we're not very good drawers. So I do a lot of pastels, but I love it. I love being with these friends and and drawing. I- Wait a second, I need to know more about this. How did you come up- like agree upon drawing as the activity. Well, I've, I've in the last about six years, I've been doing a lot of art. I kind of feel like I write music. I think in my seventies or in my late sixties, what I've noticed about my creative urge is that it's not as channeled in one direction. It's Mm -hmm. kind of sliding all over, oozing in all sorts of places. So when we had COVID, I loved going to the thrift store and buying old shirts and making masks for my friends. Uh, oh, I'd buy cashmere sweaters, old cashmere sweaters, and unravel them and make other things, blankets and hats and mittens out of them. I started doing a lot of pastels. And these friends were also doing so I'd invite them to drawing classes. And one of them is, is a graphic designer. And we just, I guess maybe two of them decided we tried having this art club. So instead of having a book club, we have this art club. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And then I have a group of of friends in Philadelphia. We've been meeting together once a month for 30 years. We just had our 30th anniversary. We're a book club, but what we do is we read books and then talk about them, not trying to understand the book as much, as trying to understand ourselves in a deeper way, according to what we're reading. So certainly when Trump was elected, we were really interested in what motivated people to vote for Trump. So we were reading a lot of books about people who we felt were, who felt disenfranchised. Uh, We meet once a month for the last 30 years. And that group is, having been with 13 other women as we have grown up over 30 years is is really an amazing experience. Uh, So, and I also garden. I have two little dogs, do a lot of reading. I go visit my kids, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Are you a grandma? I am not a grandmother. I don't think I ever will be. Oh, really? Yeah. I think my daughter, because of health reasons, has 
decided not to have children. And mm. I've just had to make my peace with that. Yeah. How about the steps? No? Hmm? You th- they're, they're still young. Okay. <laughs> they're not quite married yet. So I'm, 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 I'm hopeful. <laughs> so I was just listening to that actress, Julia Louis Dreyfus. Yeah. Uh-huh. You've been listening to her podcast? I've listened to two. Yes. Yeah. So she was interviewing Rhea Perlman. Oh, well, I haven't heard that one. Great one. Anyways, she is, I think she said she just turned 76 and she's just had her first grandchild. Yeah. And I became a grandmother at 50. And so but what she was saying at 76 was exactly how I felt at 50. It was yeah. like, transformed my life. Everything mm-hmm. has changed. And so yeah. I, I wish for that for you too. Yeah. Hopefully well, it will happen sometime soon. Yes. Are you involved in kind of good works, supporting or volunteering or any giving back in any way? I, I do to some extent. This area has a lot of refugees. In the state of Pennsylvania, I think this city has the most refugees. So I decided to get involved with the refugees. So I've been tutoring refugees. It kind of came organically because I had a lot of, I had students who were refugees who reached out to me and wanted to take piano. And so I'd sort of been introduced to the refugee community. So this is the second family that I, I've been tutoring. And right now, I'm tutoring the kids because I realize the kids don't have anybody to help them with their homework when they come home. And usually there are lots of kids in these families. This is families from Africa. I forget where. Both of the families were. And eight to 10 kids. And how can the parents help them with their English homework? So we've been doing homework club. Right, right. Um, Fantastic. What a great initiative. Yeah. Is there an app you couldn't live without? Uh, that I could not live without? Yeah. I I could live without all the apps. But because of this book, I have really had to learn to master Facebook and Instagram. Oh, yeah. I decided not to do Twitter, but I worked with a publicity company and they, they were just amazing. The publisher is a young woman-run publisher. And I was working with a music publicist who is also woman run. It just happened to be. And so I've learned a lot about advertising and I've stopped dreading it. (laughs) I realized that it's part of what I have to do if I want to follow my work. I mean, your works are like your children. There are lots of things you dread and don't want to do, but, but you have to do it because the you put these children on the earth and they have to be educated and launched and all those kinds of things. So you learn how to do it. That's my business, right? Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah. I, I'm in social media marketing. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, I really had to learn mm-hmm. how to do it. And complicated. It's complicated. It's fascinating. I always, I always love technology. I'm always interested in new innovations. I'm just always curious and the ways that I can adapt to it. I still write music with pencil and paper. Right. But I do use my computer. I'm very computer literate. So. Interesting. Is there an over 50s life hack that you'd like to share? Somebody asked me to put 11 things, 10 things together that I would uh, hit that I've learned. And actually I then went on and created 16 things that I've learned as a composer and as an artist, as a writer. A life hack when you're 50, it is interesting. One of the things I say, if you're blocked in your work, take a nap. So in other words, your brain is always such, so smart. It's really able to solve problems or put information together. If you let it just have some space. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think I would say share your joy. Communicate your love of work to others. Share rather than teach motivate rather than lecture, include rather than talk to. Because teaching many times implies a hierarchy, but sharing is between equals. And I think that people really get the sense that you value them if you're sharing. Well, thank you for sharing your time with me this afternoon. Well, thank you. 
This has been 50 Women Over 50, a podcast for women whose personal confidence is born of experience. And thank you to my guest, American composer and author, Tina Davidson, who has accomplished more personal growth since turning 50 than many of us achieved throughout the whole of our lives. She's a true inspiration to us all. See the show notes to find links to Tina's socials and her work and to find information about some of the other things that we talked about on today's show. Thank you for listening. And if you enjoyed this show, please share a link to it with your friends. Drop me a rating or a review on Apple or wherever you get your podcast from. You can also find the show on YouTube. So please follow me on socials too. Let's connect. Let's create a whole community of wise women over 50. See you next time on 50 Women Over 50. I'm your host, Sherry Lynn Starkey. Thank you.